Are there any intensive retreats that you recommend or extended retreats? And I suppose the broader question is how how can one know where to practice and vet properly, right? If, if someone wants to do a meditation retreat. And the reason I ask is, for instance, with psychedelics, which are still largely underground at this point, even though at some point, hopefully there will be an entire framework for administering them reasonably safely to people who fit certain criteria. If someone finds a facilitator who says, I've never had, no one under my care has ever had a bad trip, that is a huge red flag because it means they're either deluding themselves, they're lying, or they're really inexperienced, right? Those are kind of the only options on the table because you're, you're effectively using nuclear power <laughs> to change the you know, plasticity of the mind of course there are going to be adverse events. Of course there are going to be outliers. And so you want someone who has actually handled those cases, right? If you go to, to push my F1 analogy, if you go to a racetrack, let's just say, and you're going to a track day, and the track owner says, we've never had any accident of any type on our track. That's a bad thing because <laughs> someone's going to have an accident. You want to make sure they have protocols in place, they have experience, they have the presence of mind to handle it calmly, et cetera, et cetera. So I could see that applying also to vetting meditation retreats. But putting myself in the position of someone listening to this, I might say, holy shit, of the people who've tried meditation once, X percentage have these persistent problems. Like this seems really, really dangerous. Maybe I just shouldn't meditate. So for those people to maybe offset that a little bit, are there retreats that you ever recommend? And how can someone vet if they're considering doing a retreat? I mean, I think that a lot of it has to do with matching the goals to the person. So I don't mm -hmm. want to necessarily rule out or recommend any particular retreat across the board. Yeah. I think that there are certain retreats that are pretty repeat offenders. Mm -hmm. And those are ones that have like high dose, like 15 hours of meditation a day, no movement practice. Mm -hmm. Often you see an alternation between walking right. and sitting, and sometimes there's even yoga added. So, you know, more intense practices with no movement and also not necessarily tailored feedback from teachers. Mm -hmm. So I would be very careful before going on one of those. And I think just in general, like there are m so many different options for retreats these days. You can do like an afternoon retreat where it's only a couple mm -hmm. hours, like start there, mm -hmm. titrate up. And you can do this at home. You don't even have to necessarily spend the money. You can just download an app and do that for a day and see how you do, you know, like titrate up and, and just do it like one at a day at a time. If you're worried about like, you know, rather than signing up for a 10 day retreat. Something I have not mentioned before is that yeah. I've done shorter meditation retreats, like two or three days with no issues whatsoever. Yeah. So I just want to point that out. The other fine detail that I want to mention, because I think Spirit Rock runs a very good ship and I think they're very well formatted and they do have safeguards in place that they explicitly advise against fasting. And mm -hmm. I violated that rule. <laughs> right? I overrode that. Right. And also added the psychedelics, which certainly I had not mentioned to anyone until I had already sort of capsized. Yeah. So I think... Those are definitely things. I mean, that this this never used to be an issue, but I know that that people are doing that. That that people are bringing psychedelics on retreats, and I think a lot of the retreats they have to manage a lot of people. Yeah, people are already having like challenging experiences, the regular kind okay. <laughs> of challenging experiences with meditation. And so to have to, to manage people who are also taking psychedelics is, that's a lot, it's not really fair to a meditation retreat. So I think no, it's going to be invisible you know, to them for the most part. Yeah. I'm sure. 
right? It's not going to be reported. Just like well, people right. lie on their medical intakes about the psychiatric medications they're taking if they are wedded to taking psychedelics with a facilitator. This happens all the time. People sort of misrepresent their health status because they're so vested in this last Hail Mary Obi-Wan Kenobi or our final hope solution and panacea that they see in psychedelics. And I have to imagine that also happens with meditation retreats. I'd love for you to say a bit more about repeat offenders. Are there any other characteristics or format issues that you see producing more problems than others outside of what you already mentioned? So in terms of the retreat or meditation type or in terms of personal risk factors? The retreat or meditation type that seemed to produce a higher volume of people with these issues. I would say retreats that recruit or are attracting a certain type of meditator, which, by the way, like <laughs> you fit the bill like pretty exactly. <laughs> yeah. When I heard the story, I was like, wow, like that's pretty emblematic of like Te textbook. You know, <laughs> yeah, young male, pretty educated, combining all sorts of, of tools, you know, fairly aggressive. Yeah. We used to joke that one of the risk factors was zealotry, the kind of zealotry, <laughs> zeal. So something like that. And so people, there's a certain kind of almost like military, this is going to be a really, really hard retreat. Like those types of retreats are a little bit more high risk. And I think there's also the combination of the person and the teacher slash format. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we found that was really shocking in the varieties of contemplative experience study is that on one hand, we expected to see people who ran into problems as people who had lots of problems in their lives. But when we actually like looked at the data, like 75% had graduate degrees, MD, PhDs, JDs. You know, these were like CEOs of major companies. These were like super high achieving people. And we were like, this is so interesting. How do we make sense of that? And we're like, oh, right. Being a high achiever is a risk factor. <laughs> I was just about to say, like the drug addiction in the medical profession is off the charts, like suicides off the charts. <laughs> so, right. It's because like, these are the kinds of people that you're like, okay, you're going to sit and follow your breath, for, you know, and they're like, okay, like they, they're the ones that show up early for the meditation and they are the last ones to leave are the ones that are like, they follow instructions exactly. <laughs> and they would never modify the instructions for their own benefit. That would not even occur to them. <laughs> Unless they make it more intense. <laughs> and this is kind of where trauma comes in. If you've been trained to scan, what are the expectations here? What are the sort of unspoken social rules that I need to ace in order to not be punished? If that's like kind of your MO running in the background, then we have all these people like following instructions exactly, not modifying them, Basically, listening to an external authority rather than their own internal compass, that's the recipe for disaster. And so if you can interface with, you know, really any type of meditation, spiritual system, with your having, maintaining your inner compass, that's going to be a recipe for a much better outcome. But not, not everybody can do that, and not all systems are tolerant of that. Mm -hmm. And so... I would also encourage, and we've had lots of trainings with meditation centers trying to be able to be able to be more flexible. And so if somebody knows, like, I need to be able to leave the meditation, you know, in the middle so that I'm not like continuing to meditate and the meditation manager, meditation retreat manager is like, no, that won't be allowed. You have to stay. If you come, you have to stay for the whole thing. That's not really allowing flexibility. So are there ways that people can titrate the amount of practice that they're getting within a retreat? Is there a way to like, hey, on, on Wednesday, we'll have burger night for people who need to like <laughs> increase the like fat intake? You know, that is actually happening now. Yeah. The vegetarian diet piece is super interesting. I mean, I, I don't know if the sort of acuity is, is sufficient as a factor, but it, it makes me think also with, for instance, some of these conditions that are 
let's just say contraindicated for most psychedelic use, schizophrenia, borderline personality disorder, understanding these are all kind of like word salad things taken from the DSM, which is a, kind of a big question mark for a, a lot of reasons. But some of these more, uh, for lack of a better term, sort of chaotic conditions are contraindicated, respond really well to something called metabolic psychiatry with, and Chris Palmer has spoken about this out of Harvard, using high fat, effectively ketogenic diet, but like high fat, moderate protein. Some of these people respond incredibly well. So if you look though at the food served at these meditation retreats, uniformly, effectively the exact polar opposite, right? Which is kind of interesting. 